welcome back to the podcast history of our world. Chapter 17, The New Kingdom, Part 2, Heretics to Horemheb. 1353 BC is a rather specific date. By this time, the Mycenaean Greeks have spread throughout the Aegean, China is in the middle of the Shang Dynasty, and Egypt has a new pharaoh named Amenhotep IV and his beautiful wife Nefertiti. His ascension as lord of the two lands is marked with the usual fanfare and rejoicing throughout the region, both near and far. It's also marked by lots of mooching. Now that Egypt was an empire with land stretching deep into Nubia and up through Canaan, other regional leaders wanted to share in the good times too. I'd compare them to long-lost family members coming out of the woodwork after hearing someone won the lotto. Especially so, since the leaders of the Near East like to call each other brother as a term of endearment. For example, here's part of a letter from the king of Alashia, that's Cyprus, to Amenhotep. You are my brother. You should send me silver, my brother, a great quantity. Give me the best silver, then I will send you, my brother, all that you, my brother, request. Furthermore, my brother, the people of my land speak to me about the lumber that the king of Egypt receives from me. So, my brother, make the payment to me. Phew, needy much? Or how about Bernaburiash II, one of the Indo-European Kassite kings of Babylon following its conquest by the Hittites? When my father and your father had dealings in good friendship, they sent each other beautiful presents, and nothing they refused. Now my brother has sent me only two minas of gold, but this is a very small amount. Send then as much as your father did, and if you have little gold, send half of what your father sent. My work in the houses of the gods is abundant, and now I have begun an undertaking. Send much gold, and you, whatever do you need from my land, write it and it will be sent to you. It's got to feel annoying after a while, right? Everyone always hitting you up for money, swearing they'll pay you back. But Amenhotep doesn't give much thought to these worldly issues. He's got people for that. What he's concerned with are matters of faith and the world beyond. See, Amun-Re had been the preferred god of the pharaohs since Thebes controlled Egypt, and as we previously learned, that's the combination of the sun god Re and the Theban air god Amun. But during the previous reign of Amenhotep IV's dad, named, uh, Amenhotep III, he was really drawn into the worship of the god Harakti, which is the falcon-headed god Horus but with a really big orb above his head. This orb is called the Aten, and it represents the glorious, all-seeing sun. Amenhotep IV carried on his dad's preference for Harakti, but took it further, splitting apart the Amun-Re union and creating Re Harakti, the supremely powerful sun god. Except the more he thought about it, the more he realized. It's not so much the animal-headed god part he cared for, it was the orb, the Aten. Is not the sun the bringer of life and death? Is it not a constant, immutable presence every day? And is not the pharaoh, as son of the sun god, its avatar on earth? There is no other course. Only the Aten deserves the praise of Egypt, and Amenhotep IV shall deliver. Now no longer attached to another god, the Aten adopts an artistic change, looking much more like a sun with rays of light beaming forth, although sometimes if you look closely at the pictures, those rays end in little hands reaching out. Images of Amenhotep also reflect an artistic change, a noticeably different and unique change. Likenesses of Amenhotep have what Egyptologists and scholars of history call an expressionistic quality. One source I read called it grotesque and wasn't particularly kind to his stylistic choices. Well, the reason for this is most images and statues of Amenhotep show him with an elongated head and face, almond-shaped blissed-out eyes, and a very thin neck with low bony collarbones, a distended belly that hangs low on the waist, and pretty wide, essentially childbearing hips. Contrast this with the mighty conqueror images of previous pharaohs, and yeah, there's something definitely different here. Different but seriously cool. Words don't do it justice, you really need to look this up online. Now did he really look like this? Did he have some physical deformity that he wanted to just showcase? Maybe. Was it art with a purpose? More likely. He's combining male and female traits to reflect his role as life giver and taker, i.e. the son. He even has images of his wife and children done in this way, as his young kids apparently inherited his dad's wide hips. And through the artwork, the Aten is there, shining its heavenly light upon the family, reaching out with those hands, even while Amenhotep reaches up. 
With the increased presence of the Aten, that meant other gods were getting the boot. Rei, at least, was co-opted in Harakti, but Amun? He's out of here. Or he would be if Thebes didn't have a massive religious industry already in place for him. No doubt realizing it wouldn't do well to stay at the royal capital and promote worship of a totally different god, he sets his workers to a task, build a new capital city for him, one that would be a glorious statement to the greatness that is the Aten. And about six years into his reign, they do. About 225 miles north of Thebes, he is there with his family to announce the beginnings of a glorious new city, Akit Aten, the seat of Aten. And joined by his royal retinue, he reveals the final part of his plan to reject the vestiges of false gods. His name, Amenhotep, is a variation on Amun, meaning Amen is satisfied. No, 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 that won't do. From now on, he would be called Akin Aten, meaning useful to the Aten. And once his city is finished, he makes himself useful to his god, composing numerous psalms and hymns. Here's a little taste of one. There is none other who knows you, only your son, Neferkepa'ure, soul one of Re. You have informed him of your plans and your might. Everyone who has passed by since you founded the earth, you have raised them for your son, the one who has come from your body, the dual king who lives on truth, the lord of the two lands, Neferkepa'ure, soul one of Re. The son of Ray who lives on truth, the lord of diadems, Akhenaten, whose life is long, and the king's great wife, whom he loves, the lady of the two lands, Nefer Nefer Uatin, Nefertiti, living and youthful forever and ever. Few things. One, Neferkepaure is his throne name, like a more official name. Two, it's great that he's loving his new religion and all, but are you catching something here? He's the only one who truly gets it. Hmm. And three, when he took a new name, so did his wife, Nefertiti, now called Nefer Nefer Uratin, meaning, uh, beauteous are the beauties of Aten. Kind of a mouthful. But that last part at the end isn't fluff talk. He's a genuinely devoted husband and father, having six daughters with Nefertiti, and in another uncommon art move, openly depicts them all in happy and loving poses. He's shown cradling them, playing with them, there's one where he's putting a necklace on Nefertiti, and another one where they're holding hands. It's actually really touching and sweet stuff. Which is why, perhaps, that when tragedy strikes his household, he can't cope with it. First, his seven-year-old daughter unexpectedly dies, followed shortly thereafter by the death of his mother. Nefertiti might have died as well, or not really. Her name disappears from the record, or she might have switched over to the Nefer 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 one. Either way, this double or triple whammy is a sock in the gut for the pharaoh, and Akhenaten plunges into a deep gloom. One can absolutely sympathize with his grief, but not with the massive problems Egypt is facing since his introduction of monotheism to the land. Construction of the new capital city has drained the treasury, and faith in the Aten has not provided people with food or care. They are literally starving away in the streets, and no amount of prayer is going to fix that. This, in turn, has provided opportunity to the priests of Amun, who are none too pleased about the pharaoh's practices of sending out iconoclasts to smash statues and icons of their false god. This unrest has led to an increase in bandit attacks as well, coming from desert nomads called the Habiru. More on their origin theories in a later episode. The Canaanite vassal kings write to him asking why he does not keep them safe. The nascent Assyrians were furious their messengers were forced to wait outside in the midday sun for hours at the cost of their health, and the Babylonian king Berna Buriash, whom we heard from earlier, contacts Akhenaten about an incident involving his merchants, writing, My merchants were delayed in the Canaan town of Hanutan for business, and men there beat my merchants and stole their money. Ahutabu, whom I sent before you, was there. Ask him and he will tell you. Canaan is your country and its kings are your slaves. In your country I was robbed. Bind them and return the money they robbed. The men who murdered my slaves, kill them and avenge their blood. Because if you do not kill these men, they will again murder my caravans and even my ambassadors, and the ambassadors between us will cease. If this should happen, the people of the land will leave you. If, as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, that the measure of a man is where he stands in times of challenge and controversy, Akhenaten couldn't cut it. 
Perhaps he had felt betrayed by the god he devoted so much of his faith to that he couldn't muster the energy to save Egypt. Or perhaps the love for his family was so deep that the hole in his heart could not be mended. Akhenaten dies in 1336 BC, and his sarcophagus is guarded not by the traditional statues, nor even by the Aten, but by a statue of Nefertiti. He may have been a rotten pharaoh, but his love was truly genuine. All right, no more of this gushy stuff. He really was a terrible pharaoh. I mean, look at the mess he left. And now there's two contenders for the throne, neither of which are the real article. Instead, the crown gets passed to the lowest hereditary branch they can find, a young son he bore to one of his sisters, yeah, they don't learn the lesson of incest really well, the nine-year-old boy, Tutankhaten. And because of his young age, he was of course guided by the normal retinue of advisors, viziers, and family who all told him the same thing. No more Aten. It's tearing this land apart. And of course he agrees, closing the Aten temples, but also realizing his name was a bit of a problem as well. Tutankhaten wouldn't cut it. So to really play up the connection to the way things were before his dad messed up everything, he would simply change his name to Tutankhamun, King Tut. In the shadows of the silent sphinx and the gigantic pyramids that stood as lonely sentinels over the vast stretch of burning sand, an English archaeological expedition headed by a man named Howard Carter sought to uncover the tomb of an ancient Egyptian pharaoh, King Tut Ankhamun. The boy King Tut Ankhamun? Well, that's a new one. Is of course most famous for having a completely undisturbed tomb, found in pristine condition and totally manhandled by Howard Carter. In life, he was only notable for abandoning the capital city Akhet-Aten to relocate back to Thebes, and for restoring worship of Amun-Re and the other gods. Since his rediscovery, people have suspected that the boy king must have been murdered, palace intrigue being what it will. But while there's some pretty decent scientific explanations as to what happened to him, there's also a pretty easier explanation too. The kid was totally messed up by swimming too long in the shallow end of the gene pool. King Tut was a walking warning sign for incest. I mean, he had weak bones, an overbite, scoliosis, a club foot, intellectual deficiencies, and because he suffered an infection after breaking a leg, his immune system couldn't fend off the malaria, which is what he most likely died from. No murder, no conspiracy, and certainly no curse. His ten-year reign was quick, although despite his fragile health, he did what he could to repair his weakened country. Except once again, the throne was empty. And without any obvious claimants, now you start to see the dubious ones slither out. One thing was for certain, though, whoever became the new pharaoh would surely take King Tut's young and beautiful widow for a wife, and she, Ankh Esenamun, dreaded the very thought. Terrified of having to marry some decrepit old vizier, she took bold action to protect herself. Her salvation would not come from Amun, or even within Egypt. She entrusts her closest and most loyal servant to deliver a letter which could conceivably be considered treason. She was requesting a marriage to a son of the powerful lord of the mighty Hittite Empire, King Subaluliuma I. His domain covered most of Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, and shared a border with Egypt in northern Canaan. As a true rival to Egypt, Ankh Esenamun felt that not only could the two empires join forces, but she could also be spared getting hitched to the highest bidder. It's definitely extremely forward of her, single-handedly shaping foreign policy that could totally backfire in her face. But can you blame her? Of course, it's not like there's any guarantee from the Hittites that they'd go for this. Sounds kind of sketchy though, too, her just casually proposing a royal wedding like this. Naturally, Supaluliuma was skeptical and didn't buy what she was selling, so she managed to sneak out another letter to him and clearly laid out her demands. Why do you say they may try to deceive me? If I had a son, would I write to a foreign country in a manner which is humiliating to me and to my country? He who was my husband died and I have no sons. Shall I perhaps take a servant of mine and make him my husband? I have not written to any other country, I have written only to you. People say that you have many sons. Give me one of your sons, and he shall be my husband and king in the land of Egypt. Okay, she definitely means business, and convinced of her sincerity, Subaluliuma sent one of his sons, Zanansa, off to Egypt to seal the deal. Egypt shall have a Hittite king, and the two shall become as one. Only he never got there. 
Ankh Esenamun's conspiracy had been discovered, and the Hittite prince was murdered by unknown assassins. History is quiet as to their identities, but tradition suspects the hand of Tut's elderly vizier. Remember, it's always the vizier. While Ankh Esenamun was negotiating with the Hittites, I was busy consolidating power and support, to the point where he was declared pharaoh, and he took Ankh Esenamun as his wife. One can only imagine her horror as the nightmare had come true. Yet as uncomfortable as her situation was, it was nothing compared to the grief that King Supaliliuma felt. Heartbroken over the loss of his son, especially so that it was done under such suspicious conditions. He wrote a scathing letter to the new pharaoh. I was ready to send my son to be king, but you were already on the throne and I did not know. Concerning what you have written to me, your son has died, but I have not caused him any ill. When the queen of Egypt wrote me again, you did not. But if you had ascended to the throne in the meanwhile, you should have sent my son back to his home. What have you done with my son? Concerning the fact that no blood has been spilled between us before, the blood spilled since between us is not right. I sends a response of which only fragments remain, but reveal the man is either a sniveling liar or speaking the truth. Your accusations have no justification. You are simply spoiling for a fight against me. I seek peace and brotherhood with you. And as for your son's death, of that I am entirely innocent. No matter, the Hittites marched their armies into Egyptian Syria, seizing a good chunk of land and a fair amount of Egyptian soldiers as captives. That actually backfires, though, because a nasty plague was going around the Egyptian camp, and now the Hittites have it. Whoops. Well, the good news for them is that I lasts only four years on the throne before dying in 1319 BC and doesn't get his pick for an heir. Egypt would next have a military hero, Horemheb, assuming power, much to the delight of the people. His victories against the Kushites earned him accolades, and his favored status within the cult of Amun-Re ensured much support, especially when he went on a crusade of iconoclasm, destroying any vestiges of Akhenaten through I. Time to start all over with a brand new dynasty. His 30-year reign means he must have done something right, although for all his successes, having a son wasn't one of them. Well, that's okay, because his military background meant he had no compunction about adopting an heir from the best and most deserving of his men. He chose Paramesu, a skilled and loyal general of his, and groomed the man for his day on the throne, which came in the year 1292. And although he was already getting on in years, he had a son, and a grandson. Paramesu, now called Ramesses, would start a glorious new era in New Kingdom Egypt. Next time, we sort of just stopped with the Hittites, didn't we? I don't think they're going to forget what happened to them, especially the germ warfare stuff. Will Egypt fess up and acknowledge they murdered Zanansa? Or instead will there be a big war because talking is boring? I'm thinking the latter. We're going to end our tour through ancient Egypt on an exciting note with the world's first recorded battle, right here on the podcast history of our world. <laughs>